بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا إنه من يهدي الله فهو المهتدي ومن يضلل فلن تجد له ولي مرشدا We're going to begin inshallah with a recitation from the Quran just to get into a better state of mind, better state of heart then after that jump straight into a quick introduction about the text at hand, why it's important, the author or the compiler of the text. And then inshallah, jumping straight into some of the hadith for discussion today. <clears throat> Aoudhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim, bismillahir rahmanir rahim. لقد جاءكم رسول من أنفسكم عزيز عليه ما عنتم حريص عليكم بالمؤمنين رؤوف رحيم فإن تولوا فقل حسبي الله لا إله إلا هو عليه توكلت وهو رب العرش العظيم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على نبينا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم The book at hand, الشمائل المحمدية It looks at the character, actions, behaviors attitudes, dressing style, the way the Prophet ﷺ sat, the way he walked, the way he spoke, the way he dressed, his demeanor, his body language, what he liked to eat, what he did not like to eat, how he expressed his liking for something, how he expressed his disliking for something. So it's a beautiful comprehensive way to look at the Prophet ﷺ's life and the entirety of his character. And when we study Rasulullah's life or the the the, the character, the 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 uh, essence of who Sallallahu was, there are three sciences that you need to keep in mind. The first science is Ad Dalail al Muhammadiyah. Ad Dalail al Muhammadiyah is proof of prophethood. So this is a good uh, section or a good science for those who are trying to answer the question of how do I know that the Prophet Sallallahu is real? How do I know that he existed? And how do I know that he is who he claims to be? And he is who my family claims to be. My imam, my community. All of this love that they have for the Prophet ﷺ. How can I assert the veracity, the truth claims, and prove those truth claims? So that's an entire science. And there are lots of publications under that category. The second science would be Al-Khasais Al-Muhammadiyah. Al-Khasais Al-Muhammadiyah is basically the things that were specific to the Prophet ﷺ. What made him distinct? What responsibilities were expected from him and him alone? And the Shama'il Al-Muhammadiyah, the science of Shama'il specifically focuses on the holistic description of who the Prophet ﷺ was. So how do I know who he was? If I want to copy him, if I want to mimic him, if I want to embody his character, how do I do that? And one of the most beautiful and holistic texts, comprehensive texts, on the comprehensive nature of the Prophet ﷺ's character would be this text, as shamail al-Muhammadiyah. Now, who is the author of al-Shamail, the text that we're reading together? Who is the author, the compiler? Al-Imam al-Tirmidhi. And it's important to note a little bit about al-Imam al-Tirmidhi to appreciate the work that is being done. So al-Imam al-Tirmidhi is of the third generation, 290 Hijri. So he's living in the three early generations that the Prophet ﷺ praised. He says, خَيْرُ الْقُرُونِ قَرْنِي ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ The best of generations, my generation, because they live to see me. And then the generation immediately after that. And then the generation after that. So these early three generations are the generations that really lived the Prophet ﷺ and accessed the life of the Prophet ﷺ better than anyone else did, better than anyone else could. Yes, we live in the age of technology. You can make an argument that 
um, you have access to information about Rasulullah Sallallahu that is unprecedented, unlike anything else that has come before. But there's a difference between accessing information and accessing a lived experience, accessing a reality. So yes, we have access to information, but it's very difficult to actually find a living existence and proof of or a living implementation and manifestation of the prophetic character. So keep that in mind. Al Imam Tirmidhi was a student of Imam al Bukhari and he traveled to many, many places, collected many, many ahadith, and he was known to be one of the most dedicated students of Imam al Bukhari. Imam al Bukhari tested his memory and he said, I have not seen any student with this incredible memory before. The works that he's done, they're very, very comprehensive. The works of hadith, the works of uh, and he was, a, he was a, 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 a holistic scholar. He combined many, many, many uh, sciences under his belt. But one of the distinguishing sciences that he really excelled in was the science of hadith. And so he wrote many, many works in hadith. And these are, you can say the Shama'il is it's kind of one of his side projects, but it becomes an immense contribution to the ummah because it's one of the earliest holistic uh, compilations that focus on the prophetic character. So what we're going to do, inshallah, today is look at um, some of these chapters that he compiled detailing a description of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, the way that this would be done in a typical um, Islamic scholastic tradition, you would actually hear the hadith being recited rhythmically, poetically. Then you would hear the commentary on the hadith. So we're going to jump straight in, waste no longer with the introduction, just to get a sense of the Prophetic Sallallahu character. So here we will, inshallah, for those who are following through the text, this would be inshallah, uh, the 40th uh, title, which is Worship and Devotion of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is how it would go. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. باب ما جاء في عبادة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم حدثنا قتيبة ابن سعيد وبشر ابن معاذ قال حدثنا أبو عوانة عن زياد ابن علاقة عن المغيرة ابن شعبة قال صلى الله عليه وسلم قال صلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم حتى انتفخت قدماه فقيل له أتتكلف هذا وقد غفر الله لك ما تقدم من ذنبك وما تأخر قال أفلا أكون عبدا شكورا وعن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه قال كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يصلي حتى ترم قدما قال فقيل له أتفعل هذا وقد جاءك أن الله تعالى قد غفر لك ما تقدم من ذنبك وما تأخر قال أفلا أكون عبدا شكورا وعن الأعمش عن أبي صالح عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه قال كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقوم يصلي حتى تنتفخ قدما فيقال له يا رسول الله يا رسول الله تفعل هذا وقد غفر الله لك ما تقدم ما تقدم من ذنبك وما تأخر قال أفلا أكون عبدا شكورا وحدثتنا عائشة حينما سئلت عن صلاة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بالليل فقالت كان ينام أول الليل ثم يقوم فإذا كان من السحر أوتر ثم أتى فراشه فإذا كان له حاجة ألم بأهله فإذا سمع الأذان وثب فإذا سمع الأذان وثب فإن كان جنبا أفاض عليه من الماء وإلا توضأ وخرج إلى الصلاة. So the first four hadith, the first one is narrated by Al Mughira ibn Shuba, and he says that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he used to pray qiyam at night 
until his feet became swollen. And when he was asked, are you going to keep burdening yourself with this when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already forgiven you? What has come from your you know, mis misdeeds or shortcomings, anything that has come before and anything that is to come, he responded, shall I not be a thankful servant? Now, this is the matin of the hadith. This is what the hadith itself captures. Now, there's a context to the hadith. The context is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayah in Surah Al-Fatih. We've granted you a clear opening. Allah will forgive you what has come and what is to come. Like there's nothing now you can do no wrong by Allah. You've reached a position where Allah himself will take on perfecting your character and making you an excellent example. And Allah will fulfill His blessing, complete His blessing and bounties upon you. And Allah will guide you to the best path and along the straight path. And Allah will grant you an honorable victory. Can you imagine what a beautiful series of ayat from Allah to the Prophet ﷺ? And all this came true, by the way. All of these promises came true. This is before the fat. Everything happened, as was told in the Quran. So when these ayat were revealed, the Prophet ﷺ went home and he used to pray, let's say, a third of the night. But when these ayat were revealed, he started praying half of the night. Much longer than what he was doing previously. So he was asked, here, who asked him? And Mughir ibn Shu'ba, he says that the Prophet ﷺ used to pray for this long until he was asked. He doesn't say who asked him, which means it was asked by many people, multiple people at multiple times. Aisha saw him do this in the third hadith. We see that uh, a few of the other companions saw him do this. Ibn Abbas saw him do this. So people who were accessing his home, people that could come into his home, his wives, the nephews, the cousins of the Prophet ﷺ or the Sahaba that were young, the children of the children around the Prophet ﷺ, like, like uh, Anas ibn Malik, they were seeing him put this extra effort. So Aisha herself asked him, Ya Rasulullah, after Allah has made all of these promises to you, this is the time to celebrate, take a step back and relax. But what was his response? His response was, I used to do this much before Allah gave me all of this good news. Now that Allah has given me this good news, I should do much more as an expression of my gratitude. And one of the reminders for each and every one of us is Allah mentions, commands in the Quran, express your gratitude through action, O family of David. Meaning the best way to show gratitude to Allah is not to sit there and engage in a meditative exercise where you count your blessings because you can't do that. It's not to you know sit there and engage in a meditative exercise where you take in deep breaths. and No, it's not to do that. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he highlighted this ayah when talking about shukr and gratitude, and Allah makes it clear, I'malu, show your gratitude through action, وَقَلِيلُ مِنْ عِبَادِيَ الشَّكُورِ For verily, few of my uh, slaves, few of my worshippers are actually what? Are actually truly grateful. Now, I was just doing a, a tafsir of Surah uh, Al-Insan. Tafsir of Surah Al-Insan. How many of you attended the tafsir, by the way? Any of you? They just went, okay, that's good. So I'm just going to highlight something else here, inshallah. It'll be a reminder for you, but for all of us, uh, it'll be, inshallah, a, a, a good piece of uh, added information when talking about gratitude. When Allah talks about the human being in Surah Al-Insan, Allah said, Inna sabila, imma shakiran wa imma kafura. Inna sabila, imma shakiran wa imma kafura. We guided the human being to the ability to recognize the path. So you decide which path to take. Allah. But to access the guidance, the path of guidance, you have to meet the conditions required in order for Allah to grant you that guidance. Then Allah says, إِمَّا شَاكِرًا وَإِمَّا كَفُورًا Either the human being will become shakiran, grateful, or kafura, ungrateful. But the word used for shakiran is what? Is ismi fa'il. Ismi fa'il. So that is the noun of the person doing the action, the subject, right? The subject here where the doer, the actor, is Allah describes shakiran, shakiran. Kafura, the word used for ingratitude, is the hyperbolic form. So you can say shakiran, kafiran. 
Or you can say shakuran, kafuran. But Allah uses the basic form for gratitude. Either he or she is grateful or kafura, the hyperbolic form means what? Utterly, truly, fully, deeply ungrateful. Meaning that when you live as a human being, either you're living a life of gratitude, you're attempting, you're trying, you're, you know, you're trying to be grateful because you'll never be able to be grateful enough. Or you're going to find yourself in an immediate perpetual state of ingratitude. Why is that the case? Because if you live a life of gratitude, what happens? You'll never be grateful enough. If you live a life of gratitude, you can never be grateful enough. Why? Because Allah says, وَلَئِن شَكَرْتُمْ وَلَقَدْ أَذَنَ رَبُّكُمْ لَئِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ Your Lord has declared, made an adhan, a declaration for eternity. As long as you're grateful, I will increase you. So the more gratitude that you have, the more Allah will what? Will increase you. Which means the more grateful you are, by definition, the more that you have to be grateful. Because every time that you're grateful, Allah will give you more. And when Allah gives you more, by nature, you have to what? You have to thank Allah for that. And when you thank Allah for that, what does Allah do? Give you more. Then you have to thank Allah for that. Then what does Allah do? Give you more. So you can never ever truly show Allah enough gratitude. Because by definition, the more gratitude that you give to Allah, exponentially the more that Allah gives you back. The more that Allah gives you back. And here in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is embodying this, demonstrating this. Imma shakiran wa imma kafura. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam chooses to live a life of gratitude. And what does he do when Allah gives him more? He demonstrates and he shows more back to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. The next hadith which is narrated, um, which is narrated here by Abu Huraira, same description. Then after the Aisha radiallahu anha, same description. But she gives us a little bit more. She gives us a little bit more. And what does she say? كَانَ يَنَامُ أَوَّلَ اللَّيْلِ ثُمَّ يَقُومُ And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to sleep at the beginning of the night. Then he would get up. When it was about time for daybreak, so he would get up and he would pray a few rak'at. When it was time for qiyam, what would he do? Uh, uh, when it was time close to fajr, he would pray his witr. Then when he came to the bed, if he had a need, he would be intimate with his wife. He would spend time with his family. And when he heard the time for adhan, he would get up. And if he was in a major state of impurity, he would pour water over himself, uh, meaning he would make the ghusl. And if not, he would make the wudu. And then he would get up to go for prayer. So we're given now a, a routine of the Prophet ﷺ at night. At night, he would sleep the first part of the night, and then he would get up, he would pray. And how would he pray? We're going to see in a few ahadith later. The first thing that he would do, as soon as he gets up at night, he would make, subhanAllah, that, that dua, the dhikr that we know, and then he would make uh, wudu, two rak, uh, two, uh, wudu, and then he would pray two rakahs. But before he would pray those two rakahs, he would go out and he would look up in the night, in the cold of the night, in the dark of the night, up at the moon and up at the stars. And he would read the ending of Surah Al-Imran. إِنَّ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافُ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ayat of the Lord, 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 the, the source of all power. So he would get up and he would pray his two rakahs. And the first two rakahs would be quick, quick rakahs. Why would they be quick? Because he's getting into the zone. He's getting into the zone. So he's reading, reflecting on Surah Al-Imran, the last two pages or so, a page and a half of Surah Al-Imran. Then every other two rakahs ahead of that would be perpetually longer, longer, longer until right before uh, Fajr. It's about to be Fajr time. So he would pray with him, and then he would go back to sleep. Now, when he goes back to sleep, he's not fully sleeping. He's just resting his eyes. You can say he's lying down. Sometimes he would doze out. Sometimes he wouldn't. Most times he would just, uh, he would just rest. And during that time, right before, again, Fajr, he would be, you know, next to his family, Aisha radiallahu anha, that was his family time. He would spend a little bit of time with his wife radiallahu anha. And when he got up, if they were intimate, he would make the ghusl. If they would not, he would make wudu. 
And he would wait for the knock of Bilal to announce to him that it's time for the adhan. Ask him permission. Ya Rasulullah, may I give the adhan out of respect? Prophet ﷺ would give Bilal or Abdullah ibn Maktoum, depending on who was scheduled, the permission. They would get up and do the adhan. And then the Prophet ﷺ would do the ghusl and he would go to the masjid to pray fajr with the companions. And that gives you a sense of how his night routine was structured. Tamam. Here we have another, um, another description where let's see if we can get someone else to read this time. We'll just do the English reading. Can somebody read the... Um, the description here, inshallah. So, عن عن ابن عباس أنه أخبره أن بات عند ميمونة وهي خالته فقال فجعتس who would like to read? Does anybody want to try to read the Arabic and then try to read the English? Anybody comfortable enough to read the Arabic? Don't be shy. Go ahead, inshallah. ففتلها Perfect. So Ibn Abbas here is saying, I went and I spent the night in the home of my uh, my aunt, maternal aunt, Maymuna, who was the Prophet Sallallahu wife. She got to see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi at night. And what does he describe? He said, we shared the, we shared the place where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi slept. So how did I sleep? He said, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi he reclined, um, I reclined across the cushion, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi reclined lengthwise. So the Prophet Sallallahu slept this way, lengthwise, on the bed, and then Ibn Abbas sleeps this way. And that goes to show that Ibn Abbas was young at this time. And this is, you know, his aunt's uh, house, so he's having a, having a sleepover. And when it was time, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he got up, he encouraged him to come forward and to pray next to him. So they pray next to each other. That's where we get the hadith. If two people are praying next to each other, they shouldn't, one shouldn't be too far ahead of the other. They should be a little bit closer. Because the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used his hand to push him forward. This happened in other hadith, in another few, in another, uh, few hadith. And then the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as we see the description, he looked up, looked at uh, the, the moon in another riwayah. Here he recited the ending of Surah Al-Imran. And then he pulled uh, Ibn Abbas close to him. And he, he, he prayed six rakats, one after the other, until it was time for witr when the Mu'addin came to wake him up. Another narration here, if I'm Ibn Abbas, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to pray in total 13 thalatha ashrata uh, raka. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to pray 13 rakats in total. That means eight rakat of qiyam, and then uh, or uh, eleven rakat of qiyam, uh, ten ten rakat of qiyam, and then eleven, twelve, thirteen. And this goes to show that the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to pray sometimes six rakat, sometimes he used to pray eight rakat, sometimes he used to pray ten rakat, and then with it would be three rakat or one rakat. And that's where we get the whole you know discussion on whether you can pray, you should pray eight rakat for uh, Ramadan or you pray 11 rakat, or you pray 20 rakat, all of these, the Prophet Sallallahu depending on the time that he had, he would continue to pray, 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 until it's as close to Fajr as possible. Then he would do his routine of going back, sleeping a little bit, and then waking back up. So that's where we get the whole um, discussion, or small debates. It's not a big debate at all. It shouldn't be that 
uh, big in any shape or form, where we get the discussion on how many rak'ah should be done for witr or should be done for qiyam. Okay? Good. Um, a few other hadith here uh, that talk about the length of the salawat. You can read them, inshallah, on your own. You get the idea from all of these hadith that the Nabi Sallallahu used to pray either nine, tisa rak'at, 13 rak'at, six rak'at, and then witr. And then here we have a description uh, of what he used to pray. So we'll read this hadith here, inshallah. Um, and this is the hadith of Qudayfa ibn al -Yaman. So let's read it, inshallah. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask for an English reader. English reader. I'll stop and I'll do the Arabi and then he'll do the English translation immediately after. So who would like to be the English reader? Maybe one of the sisters this time? You'll just follow along with the English. One of the sisters, Bismillah. You'll do it. I don't want to put you on the spot. You'll no, I'll do one one section. You'll read along with the English, okay? So, Bismillah. An Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, أنه صلى مع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من الليل. قال فلما دخل في الصلاة قال الله أكبر ذو الملكوت والجبروت والكبرياء والعظمة. Perfect. So Hadaif here gives us a description of what the Prophet ﷺ would say. So he got up for the salah and when he said Allahu Akbar, what did he say at the beginning? He said Allahu Akbar Dhul Malakuti Wal Jabaruti Wal Kibriya Wal Abamati. Allah is the greatest. Allah is greater than anything else. He's the Lord of power, the Lord of sovereignty. The Lord of Magnificence, the Lord of Greatness. This is what he would say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, before he would continue. Then what would he say? Qala, thumma qara al-baqara, thumma raka ruku'a, nahwa min qiyamihi. So continue reading. So, ثم قرأ البقرة ثم ركع ركوعه نحوا من قيامه ثم ركع ركوعه نحوا من قيامه So this means he recited Surah Al-Baqarah standing and then when he went for ruku' his ruku' was as long as his standing. So how long does it take you guys to recite Surah Al-Baqarah? It's 280 what? Six ayat. Takes approximately if you're doing hadr. Uh, if you do Hadr, it would take you an hour and a half, right? An hour and a half. Uh, if you're doing a little faster, yeah, if you're doing Tajweed, it'll take you an hour and a half. If you're doing a little faster, it might take you 45 minutes, a faster pace, but not shorter than that, not shorter than an hour. If you're reading the way the Prophet ﷺ would read, we'll get a description of that later on in Tilawa. We're talking about an hour of standing in prayer, and then in Ruku, it will be the same time. Now, how many of us do that? You ask yourself, how fast is the ruku'a? So imagine the Prophet ﷺ would stay in ruku'a as long as it took him to recite Surah Al-Baqarah. Let that sink in. This is the worship of the Prophet ﷺ. Then, Yaqul, what does he say in ruku'a? Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim. Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim. He would continue to repeat, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, feeling the meaning and the significance of that. Subhana from Sabaha, high above. I'm moving Allah away from any imperfection in my mind, in my heart. I'm moving Allah away from any limitation. Subhana Rabbil Azim, my Lord, my provider, my nourisher, the Lord of greatness. Then he would raise his head again. Then when he would get up again before the sujood, 
his qiyam would be as long as his ruku'ah. So his ruku'ah is as long as his qiyam. Then again, he would get up and he would continue to stand before the sujood. Before the sujood. And he would stand for roughly the same amount. So anytime the Prophet ﷺ moved from a motion to a motion, he would take his time. And this is a good point to add here. Remember the man who came into the masjid and prayed. And the Prophet ﷺ told him, Irji' tasalli fa innaka lam tusalli. Go back and pray for you have not prayed. He said, Ya Rasulullah, what do you mean? So he went back and prayed again and again three times. And he came and said, Ya Rasulullah, I don't know. This is, this is what I know, but like, I don't know what else to do. He told him, you have to pray and you stand as, until you feel tamananiya, until you feel tranquility and calm. And then you go into your ruku' and you wait until you feel tamananiya. And then you come back and stand until you feel tamananiya, until you feel tranquility. And then you go back in your sujood and you wait until you feel tranquility. And the question that we should all be asking ourselves is, is, is this how we pray? And imagine if we did pray this way. Wallahi, if you actually implemented this, just to take away. If you implemented the way the Prophet Sallallahu used to pray, I'm not saying stand in your prayer for four or five hours. I know your students, I, I understand I'm in the same phase. Uh, so I, I, I empathize. But at least implement. If you're gonna, if you're gonna stand in prayer, reading Quran for 10 minutes, do your report 10 minutes, and then stand up again 10 minutes, and then go into your first sujood 10 minutes, get back up, then 10 minutes. So give everything the same time. Make your prayer again. You're presenting something beautiful for Allah. You're connecting with Allah. So don't rush. Don't rush. And remember, it's a conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like uh, Surah Al-Fatiha, we know the hadith where Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi says, when you say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Allah responds and says, what? Hamidani Abdi. My slave has expressed gratitude and praise. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the angels, O oh angels, grant him more. Grant him what he desires. Then you say, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. My servant has recognized my mercy. Grant him mercy. Maliki yawmiddin. My servant has recognized that I'm the one that's going to, 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 to be um, the king, the owner of the day of resurrection. Grant him mercy on that day. Until finally, the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks, what is, my, what is my servant asking? What are they asking for? And the angels say, they're making the dua, Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem. Oh Allah, guide us to and along the straight path. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds, give them what they've come to ask for. If they mean it. If they mean it. So again, it's important to think about that. And also what we take from this hadith is what an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say. Subhana Rabbi al-Azim in his ruku' Subhana Rabbi al-A'la in his sujood. And Rabbi ghfirli, Rabbi ghfirli in between the sujood or in the sujood. And then of course, he would do this right after the takbir, takbirat al-ihram. He would say, Allahu Akbar, Dhul Malakuti wal Jabaruti wal Kibriyai wal Azana. Some of us, we start the Fat, we start Allahu Akbar, and then we start the Fatiha right away without doing the opening dua of the Salah. And you should at least know one of the opening duas that Nabi used to do. What's another one that we should do besides this one? There's another one. There's a few more. Give me one. Hmm? So, louder. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdika. وَتَبَارَكَ اسْمُكَ وَتَعَالَ جَدُّكَ وَلَا إِلَهَ غَيْرُكَ So that's another one that we should do after the takbirat al-ihram. So break it down again. First one. سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُمَّ بِحَمْدِكَ So you're doing tasbih of Allah. Allah, you are above any imperfections. وَبِحَمْدِكَ And I do so expressing your gratitude to you for teaching me. To, 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 to worship you this way. وَتَبَارَكَ right? And your, your names are blessed, a source of blessing. The more that I mention your name, the more that I have ziyada fil khayr. Al-barakah is ziyada fil khayr. The more that I mention your name, the more blessings or the more khayr that I experience. وَتَعَالَ جَدُّكَ Your, 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 your uh, greatness is, is high, raised above anything else. Right? You are above any, anything else in your greatness. And there's no deity worthy of worship or affinity or love to besides you. So here we see, I'm giving you guys the point of this again, is to feel a sample of how the Prophet ﷺ used to behave with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we do what? So that we can enjoy this inshaAllah further and read further on our own time.
So this is again a sampler for us to go back to the Shema'id and read it all in full, inshallah, when we have uh, or when we have a full course available in the masjid, inshallah, you're invited to join. Now Aisha, Imam Tirmidhi here, he gives us another hadith in the same bab. And this hadith, what is what is uh, what does Aisha say? He said, Qalat, Qama Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bi ayatin min al-Qur'an laylatan. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he stood the entire night reciting just one ayah. So why do you think an Imam Al-Tirmidhi is giving you a hadith where Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited Al-Baqarah, Ali Imran, and nisa the hadith before, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited Al-Baqarah, Ali Imran, and nisa in one night. And here we see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stood and he recited one ayah the whole night to show you that it's not necessarily about quantity, it's about quality as well. So sometimes the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited a lot and sometimes he recited little, reflecting on the ayah. And if you're wondering, subhanAllah, what that ayah is that he recited the entire night, we have another hadith and that hadith adds that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited the ayah from Surah An-Nisa which is what? The ayah إِن تُعَذِّبْهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ عِبَادُ وَإِن تَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ فَإِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ If you choose to punish them, they are your slaves, they are your servants. Who am I to contest? You love them way more than I do. And if you choose to forgive them, you're the Almighty, the All-Wise. Surah Al-Ma'idah, sorry, not Surah Al-Nisa, Surah Al-Ma'idah, the 118th ayah of Surah Al-Ma'idah. And this ayah, uh, the Prophet ﷺ would ponder upon and recite the entire night, repeating over and over and over again. Tamam. The other hadith here, um, here we have uh, Ibn Mas'ud reporting and narrating something similar. Now, this one is, is, uh, is, is interesting to, to read. We'll read it, inshallah, together also because it adds another layer of the Prophet um prayer and how long it was. So we'll do the English, uh, we'll do the Arabic, and then I'll ask for a translator. Maybe we can get a brother this time. It's an easy one. I'm going to read the Arabic. Who would like to translate? Yeah, go ahead, inshallah. So I'll do the Arabic. So, عن أبي وائل عن عبد الله بن مسعود رضي الله عنه قال صليت ليلة مع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فلم يزل قائما حتى هممت بأمر سوء قيل له وما هممت به قال هممت أن أقعد وأدع النبي صلى, وأدع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم So I want you to imagine Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam here, he's in his 50s, perhaps even, you know, almost 60 years old. And he said, I stood next to him at night. I made a mistake one night. I visited him at night and I saw that he's praying. So I prayed next to him. But he prayed for so long. You can imagine that he started to feel his knees buckling, his knees giving in. And he said, I almost did something bad. <laughs> What did you do that was almost bad? I almost left the Nabi Sallallahu and dipped. I almost ran. But he didn't. He didn't. And some of the scholars of hadith, they say that, uh, and this is of course, yani, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a teaseful joke. It's a teaseful joke. They say that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all of these young, eager children would want to be with him at night. Because that's when they would get him to, you know, get him all by himself. But he also has family at home. So in order to make sure that they don't come back, like you want to spend the night? Okay, we'll pray. And he would pray for, you know, five, six hours so they would not come back again. But that's not, that's not the attitude of the Prophet Wasallam. It's just, a, you know, a joke, the, a lighthearted joke that some make uh, because maybe that's what they do with their students, right? But a Nabi Wasallam, he would elongate the prayer because he, like, he liked to be with Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, and he did this consistently, right? Even with his wife, Aisha radiallahu anha, and his other wives, he did the same. The other ahadith, they give us again uh, another dimension. So, سألت عائشة عن صلاة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم عن تطوعه فقالت كان يصلي ليلا طويلا قائما وليلا طويلا قاعدا 
فإذا قرأ وهو قائم ركع وسجد وهو قائم وإذا قرأ وهو جالس ركع وسجد وهو جالس And this is important here Aisha tells us the Prophet ﷺ used to pray standing and sometimes he used to pray sitting as well And when he prayed standing he would do his ruku' and sujood regularly but when he would pray sitting he would also pray his ruku' sitting and sujood sitting Now when do you think the Prophet ﷺ used to pray sitting? Towards the end of his life when he became sick so when he became sick and could no longer stand as much, he would still do the same amount, but he would do it sitting and he would do it sometimes lying down very, very last moments of his life. And that's why Nabi Sallallahu said the hadith, pray standing if you cannot, pray sitting if you cannot, pray lying down if you cannot, pray with your eyes if you cannot, pray with your mind. Think, imagine, if you cannot, well, then you should have prayed before you're dead because that's what it means. If you can't even think about praying or imagine yourself to be praying, then you should have prayed before you passed. But Nabi Wasallam he gave us again and he continued consistently, even when he could no longer stand for that long, he would do the same. He would honor that time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by doing it sitting or doing it very, very rarely at the end of his life, lying down when he was so tired and so sick they could not stand or even sit, sit up. Okay, perfect. Here in this hadith, we see that the Prophet ﷺ used to pray two rak'ahs that are very quick, khafifataini, khafifataini. And when he would do these two, uh, two rak'ahs, he would do this right after the call to pray, uh, between the adhan and the iqama, he would pray another two rak'ahs. And this is the sunnah of fajr, because the time would be very short. And sometimes he would have to make ghusl, so making ghusl and praying two rak'ahs quickly, and then going to the, uh, mas going to the masjid. And here we learn something important. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he never let the sunnah of fajr go. There are two sunnah that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never let go. Even if he's traveling, even if he has very little time, he would still do it. Even if it takes him, let's say a minute, rushed more than usual. Imagine the qiyam, he would take a very long time. But this he would do even if it's quick. What, what are those two sunnah? Witr, so the witr salah, he would make sure that it's done. Uh, never compromise, and that's why for the Hanafis it's wajib. And he would do the sunnah of fajr, the two rak'ahs of fajr, even if he does them quickly, like 10 minutes or two minutes or even a minute, he would make sure that it's not done. It's not missed out. Perfect. So here you can read, inshallah, the rest on your own. But this is bab ma ja'a fi salat al-nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, fi ibadat al-nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, what I want to focus on next is qira'ati rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because this is one... That also is quite, quite unique as well. So let's listen to this. Suilat Umm Salama An Qiraati Rasulillahi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Thaqalat Aw Faida Hiya Tan'atu Qiraatan Mufassaratan Harfan Harfa So when Umm Salama was asked how the Prophet ﷺ used to recite the Qur'an, what did she say? She said that you could hear the tafsir of the Qur'an in the recitation of the Prophet ﷺ. Harfa and harfa. Every single letter would be enunciated. Like you would actually hear the meaning of the ayat the way that the Prophet ﷺ used to recite. That's one. When Anas ibn Malik was asked, كيف كانت قراءة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال مدى He also described it as it's extended extended He would extend the long vowels, the mudud So for example الحمد لله رب العالمين He would do the extensions Long mudud, he would give them the right that they deserve فقاء كل ذي that's the definition of Tajweed. Giving every letter the right that it deserves and the time that it deserves. Umm Salama also قالت كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يقطع قراءته يقول الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم يقف ثم يقول الرحمن الرحيم ثم يقف وكان يقرأ ملك يوم الدين. The Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم used to also stop between every single ayah that he used to recite giving time also for reflection, for introspection. Wa Aisha, here Abi Qais, Abdullah ibn Abi Qais, 
قال سألت عائشة عن قراءة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أكان يسر بالقراءة أم يجهر قالت كل ذلك قد كان يفعل قد كان ربما أسر وربما جهر فقلت الحمد لله الذي جعل في الأمر سعة Here he says, I asked Aisha, did the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi used to recite out loud or did he used to recite silently when he stood in Qiyam at night alone? He says, sometimes he used to recite out loud so I can hear him and everybody could hear him. And sometimes he would just simply whisper. You know, sometimes late at night, you don't have the energy, your voice is giving out, you get tired after some time. So you recite for 10, 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour and a half. But then after that, you need to give your voice a break. So doing both is fine in Qiyam at, uh, at home alone. Both are fine, and that's why he said, Alhamdulillah, الذي جعل في الأمر ساعة Alhamdulillah, all praise be to Allah, who made things easy, who gave a few options, this flexibility in the matter. Here, another one, Umm Hani, she said, كنت أسمع قراءة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بالليل وأنا على عريشي. She was sitting, and uh, at night, uh, far, far, far away from where he was standing, but she was able to hear him still reciting. That goes to, say, that goes to show you, they used to also recite out loud as well. Here again, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, based, uh, based on uh, Shu'ba, who says they heard from Muawiyah, this is not Muawiyah uh, ibn Nabi Sufyan, this is Muawiyah, Muawiyah ibn Qurra. And when you study hadith, by the way, we study this formally, of course we're limited on time, you would actually do the biography of each and every one of these people. You would, why, why is he the one narrating this hadith? What makes him unique? What access did he have to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? How reliable is he? All of this would be studied in extensive detail, depending on the biography available to us. And that's known as Ilm al-Rijal, the science of, um, the science of uh, reliability of transmission of men and women. And also at Jarf wa Ta'deel, Ilm al-Jarf wa Ta'deel, which is what? Which is praising, uh, fixing, uh, critiquing, criticism, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, grading the narrations that come to us. How reliable is this? How reliable is this narrator? And the Jarhan Ta'deel is a very extensive science, extensive science, right? Al Hadith wa Rijal, it's a lot has been published, subhanAllah, in the matter. But you would do this also in the, uh, in the typical uh, study of the Quran. Right. So if we combine all of these together, all of these ahadith together in this bab, um, I remember, subhanAllah, when you first study with uh, the Shuyukh and the Mashaykh, um, they would give you a uh, a physical lived example of how that would sound like. The Nabi Sallallahu recitation would be, and I've, uh, some of you have heard this before, of course, it would be long, it would be enunciated, he would stop at every ayah, and if the ayah is long, he would stop in between, and he would give enough time, if he's reciting publicly, for people to be able to reflect on the ayah, and if he's reciting alone, he would also give enough time in between to make dua. So if it's an ayah about punishment, he would make dua, oh Allah protect us. If it's an ayah about mercy, he would make dua, Ya Allah, give it to us. So how would it sound like if you put all of these ahadith together? It would sound something like this. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين. So this is how he صلى الله عليه وسلم would recite, compose. It's reflective, and this time in between to make dua. الرحمن الرحيم. Ya Allah, Allah marhamna bi rahmatika ya Rabbil Alameen. Malik yawm al-deen. Allah maghfir lana khatayana yawm al-deen. Wala tukhuzrini yawm yubaathoon. Yawm la yanfa'u malin wa la banoon. Illa man atallaha bi qalbin salim. So we make dua in between reflecting on the meanings of the ayah. 
Now, what's interesting here is um, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also, there are two ahadith that we have at the very end. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she said, كَانَ لَا يُرَجِّعُ كَانَ لَا يُرَجِّعُ And this is narrated by Qatada here. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, كَانَ لَا يُرَجِّعُ But then there's another narration which says, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, كَانَ يُرَجِّعُ So what does يُرَجِّعُ mean? So Tarjiya in uh, in 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 uh, in um, uh, recitation sciences, it's when you um, when you do waves in the sound, so you make it go up and down when there's uh, mad, when there's an elongation. And excessive tarjih is actually very like very much disliked by Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, especially with the uh, recent uh, uh, exposure to Western uh, traditions of phonetics and sound and music and all of this stuff. We're very much affected. Especially with auto tuning now and audio tuning, uh, so Tarjeet would sound something like this: Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin, like in, right? Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. Like a lot of people, we can recite like that. It might even sound nice to some ears because you're, you're used to a specific style of. But that's not how the Prophet Sallallahu used to recite. And he disliked this kind of recitation. Because what it did is it took away from the meaning. So he recited a more sober recitation where he would give the mad. And he did a little bit of tarjiyah, but this is called reflective tarjiyah. Where you're, 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 you're letting the sound itself inflect and echo, but very, very controlled. Imagine the wavelengths are very controlled. So it would go something like this. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. You see that? So that it's a little bit of tarjih, but it's reflective. That's fine. Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. Maniki Yawmiddin. That's fine. And some people, out of, out of yeah, respecting a hadith like this, they even avoid that. Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, and they try to they try to make it as uh, sober as possible. So keep that in mind. That's what we're talking about in terms of permissible tarjiyah and impermissible tarjiyah. And if you do a tajweed competition, for example, you will be disqualified in a tajweed competition, or you'll be ducked a great amount if you do tarjiyah or you do an izalati. Those two things, like basics, yeah, I mean, they they. Uh, they demonstrate that you, you, you lack the basics of Tajweed sciences. And what's the zality? Where you recite the uh, mudud, the elongations from your nose. Because that also is, is, is going against the makharaj. I'm going to give you an example of how yani, detailed the scholars would be just to implement and honor the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and his recitation. That is where you say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So it's coming from your nose. And the way to test is, again, plug your nose when you're doing the tajweed, or when you're doing the elongation, the mudud. If your sound is still the same, then you're, you're doing fine. But if it stops, it means it's actually coming from your nose, and that is disliked. So, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil So that's from? That's not from your nose. That's not nizalat. Versus That's from your nose, right? So the plug test to make sure that you're implementing the sunnah of the Prophet Now, why do I give you this example? Why do I give you this example here? Because there are certain things that you cannot really attain just reading the text. Like, what is tarjiya? What does that even mean? You have to actually see these things implemented. That's one. And two, there are also, um, it shows you how specific the scholars focus on transmitting the sound of the Prophet like even the sound of the Qur'an. What did he do? What did he not do? What was his tarjiyah like? What was the echoing? How much was okay? How little? And just imagine. That itself is, is incredible. And incredible. It shows you how much they loved the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And how much they honored the Qur'an. How much they honored the Qur'an. How much they honored the word of Allah. How much attention they put to ensure that they're reciting the exact same way that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to recite. And that's why getting an ijazah, you know, we're, we're, we're in a, subhanAllah, in, in the Western uh, discourse and, and, and scientific tradition, everything that we do here is, is quite rushed. And I know Maghrib just came in, so we'll take a break, inshallah, in a second and pray Maghrib. 
but everything is rushed. We're going from one module to another class to class. Get your degree, get your exams, tick, 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 tick. Get your, you know, your depth and breadth and uh, major, minor, class, move on and go into the workforce and learn in the workforce. But the Islamic tradition is a lot more nuanced and you really have to make sure that you master a specific subhanAllah science before you're able to uh, continue and, and, and move. And there's an entire philosophy of learning that is uh, good to even engage with the science of ijazat and attaining ijazat. It's quite beautiful to think about and to reflect on. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the Mujawad style is, yani, if you look at the descriptions of the Prophet Sallallahu recitation, Mufassara, Harfan Harfa, every letter is enunciated. You come to realize, especially when you're teaching children, when you rush and you do Tartil, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, you really miss out on the enunciation points. Like you can't really hear where is the letter coming from. So the Tajweed style of the Quran, you know, Alhamdulillah, very, you're hearing every letter, every enunciation, every makhraj. So the intention behind it was to make sure that it's enunciated well for educational purposes. But then what happened after some time, it became very rhythmic and people started adding, you know, mics and sounds and echoes and then it became uh, performative. All right? Sorry? Theatrical, yeah. Out of respect, I mean, I'm sure some people are not performing. Uh, theater, they're really engaging with it, but it's just a, it, maybe they took it a little bit too much that it began to uh, go against. Yani, and you, you see some videos, some videos that are quite interesting. But right. Maghrib time is here, so inshallah, let's uh, pray Maghrib. Do we have a place to pray here or can we just pray in the room? Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, we'll pray here, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Subhanakallah, bihamdika. Nashiru la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka la tuba laik. And we'll continue, inshallah. Actually, I think we'll we'll break for tonight, inshallah, because Maghrib is here, so we'll continue next week, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.